But I think overall, the effect, if you look at wages and prices, the, the effect for most people is going to be an increase in wealth. However, we're going to get some people that don't have jobs, have no hope of jobs, and have no health care. And if that drives politics, then we're going to be in trouble. It's my pleasure to welcome Michael Munger to the show. He is Director of Undergraduate Studies, uh, Professor of Political Science, and Director of Philosophy, Politics, and Economics Certificate Program at Duke University. He's a Senior Fellow at the American Institute of Economic Research, former Libertarian candidate for Governor of North Carolina back in 2008. He's the author of several books, including Is Capitalism Sustainable? Tomorrow 3.0. And that is about uh, transaction cost in the sharing economy and his upcoming book, Platforms, Perils and Promise. Mike, welcome. How are you? I'm just great. Thanks for having me on the show, Jason. It, it's good to have you on the show. We have to, of course, do what everybody's doing nowadays and censor ourselves, lest we may never be heard by anybody because the the new TASS news agency, the Ministry of Thought, is uh, is evaluating every word said on every publishing platform nowadays. It's absolutely scary time. Where do you want to go first? Uh, do you want to just sort of talk generally, you know, give, give us some of your thoughts on, on what's going on in the world or, or dive into some of the books? Well, let me give a little background on what led me to write the books, I have become interested in the problem of commodifying excess capacity. And that sounds sort of complicated, but what it really means is we have a bunch of stuff in our closets in our garage and we don't use it very much. And the reason we don't use it is that it's cheaper to store it than it is to rent it out. But there's a bunch of apps and a lot of entrepreneurs thinking of ways to help us share things. And so the, the sharing economy, to the extent that it has not been regulated out of existence, the sharing economy has made a lot of progress in helping us share things in new ways. And the result has been there, there's been a disruption to traditional capitalism and to the way that we think of jobs that mean that I mean, regulations are never very nimble. They're always fighting the last war. But I worry, and the reason my book was entitled Tomorrow 3.0, is that I worry that we're on the verge of the third great disruption, the first being the change to agricultural society, the second being the Industrial Revolution. This third one may mean that traditional markets and jobs are on the verge of disappearing. If that's true, then things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. And of course, on top of all that, having the virus and the economic overreaction and lockdown uh, and the attempts to censor and control speech in the political frame mean that we're, this is these are very interesting times. And interesting is um, a very soft and friendly way to put it, but I, I understand the Chinese reference, may you live in interesting times, so we are definitely living in them. But when you refer to the disruption, are you referring really to the sharing economy or the gig economy? I know those overlap to some extent, but maybe you can smoke that out for us a little more. The Biden administration is going to try to pass a $15 minimum wage because for reasons that escape me, they think that a 17-year-old teenager in her first job should earn pay that's high enough to support a family of four. I, I don't get that. It seems like a lot of people pay to go to college. They want to get training. So the gig economy is a series of relatively short jobs for people that are highly specialized. But think of it this way. It used to be that you would go into McDonald's and you would look up on a board and say some words and the person behind the counter would look for the corresponding words on her uh, cash register. And then she would press those buttons, Big Mac, fries. All you have to do is turn the cash register around. And now instead of looking up at the board, you can press those buttons on a kiosk. So the result is service jobs, the things that used to be the gateway, the entry to the, the life of work are fast disappearing. The unemployment rate is 25, 30% for people from 18 to 25. And it's going to get much worse quickly if we have a very high minimum wage. Well, so, well, I, w I was actually going to make my snarky remark when you first opened that statement. I was going to say that 17-year-old high school student that you refer to with a $15 an hour minimum wage, we won't have to worry because she won't be offered a job. 
Well, you we just have to worry. The job, will, the job will disappear. It'll yes. it'll be automated out of existence. Whereas now we're in this era where yeah, there's definitely some automation, but employers can still justify paying a human too and having the human touch. And you know this also goes into and I don't want we don't have to jump down this rabbit hole unless you want to, but it, it goes into something I've been talking a lot about recently, Mike, which is real inflation. And, you know, everything nowadays, yeah, maybe there's not as much inflation as we would think with all this fake money creation, but we're doing everything ourselves now. Everything is self-service. I mean, you know, you're, you're punching in your own order at McDonald's, you're, you're pumping your own gas, you know, so no one's counting this in inflation. All these even fancy restaurants are like these minimum service restaurants. You go to, you know, I just stayed at the gorgeous, iconic Fountain Blue Hotel last week, speaking at a conference here in Miami. And, you know, there's like no people there. There's no staff. <laughs> there's nobody to help you with anything. It's, it's it's like everything's being run on a skeleton crew. And that's partly because of COVID and partly because of the increased cost of labor. So yeah. I actually think that the traditional economic aggregates that we used to use inflation, money supply, GDP, those are all on the verge of being meaningless, which means that we're, we're operating in a fog. And so we have regulators who think they should do something, political pressure to say, well, you have to do something and fix this because we're in trouble, and no useful information about what to do. So it's a recipe for disaster. Okay, so with the minimum wage discussion, connect the sharing economy with that and, and that sort of big statement you opened with, if you would. Well, the, the sharing economy is we use apps and software to do things that human beings used to do. So suppose I were going to buy a house. I can now do it on Zillow. I don't need a broker. Uh, suppose I want to get some food delivered. I can use Uber rather than the, the pizza company having a delivery service. So what used to be jobs, I now can use an app instead of. And so the, the, the sharing economy, there's a lot of good things about it. There's a, a app called Turo, I'm sorry. Sure, which, where you can share your car. Yeah. But it's just, it, 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 the Miami airport, there's a whole bunch of cars in the Hertz lot. And then right beside it, there's a whole bunch of cars that people are paying to park. If you could combine those two things, you could get by with a lot fewer cars. So that's the reason that they connect. We, we only need something like 40, 50 million cars in the United States. Most of the time they're parked. If we were using all those cars all of the time, we could get by on far fewer cars, but then that means we need a lot fewer people to make cars. Once we start sharing things, we need a lot less of it. And that's true of almost everything. It's true of power drills. It's true of lawnmowers. So all of the things that now we pay to store, we could be sharing. And so the, 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 the consequence of that is the number of jobs is just going to plummet. And so you talked about inflation. I think what's going to happen is the price of many things is going to fall and wages are going to fall. The question is, what will happen to real wages? Real wages are my wage rate divided by the price level. If prices fall, but my wage falls by less, and that'll happen to me, I have a very specialized job. That's great. However, if your wage falls to zero, then there is some question about how we're going to handle that. And notice that the minimum wage does nothing to solve that. If you don't have a job, it doesn't matter what the minimum wage is. And as you said, minimum wage means you're less likely to have a job in the first place. Yeah. Right, right. Now, minimum wage, maximum stupidity. It's a terrible idea. It doesn't make sense. What are we going to do instead? Yeah. What are we going to do instead? What business is it of the government to get in the middle of somebody that, who wants to work and someone who wants to hire, right? You know, ship, they, sure, but that ship has sailed. We're going yeah. to do something. We have to pick the least bad thing. Sure. Okay, so what do we do? I have actually decided that I'm in favor of universal basic income. And there's two yeah. reasons. <laughs> Oddly, I can't believe I'm coming around to that. I just think it's sort of a foregone conclusion. But why are you in favor of it? I had Andrew Yang on the show. He ran for president. That was a big part of his platform. Uh, as you know, why are you in favor of UBI? I mean, being a libertarian, it seems rather amazing you would be in favor of it. So tell us. I'm a directional libertarian, not a destinationist libertarian. So the, I've made this distinction in a number of things that I've written. What I would like tell, to tell us about that the distinction. The, what, what does that mean? Destinationist libertarians have an idea that the only things that we should do mean the complete elimination of the state and taxes. 
Well, yeah. I actually ran for office twice, once for governor and most recently for the North Carolina General Assembly. Not many people are persuaded by that platform. However, if you're a directionalist and you say, here's a direction we can take, let's go this direction. We already spend enough money to eliminate poverty in the United States. If you look at the total level of poverty programs in the U.S. and divide by the number of poor people, if we just gave them the money, there wouldn't be any poor people, but we don't. We send bureaucrats to pester them and look under their bed and say, does a man live here? Do you have a job? Because if you're married or if you have a job, you lose your benefits. So we have a remarkable system where I, I have called the state a bad polygamist. That is the state has all of these common law wives that completely depend on the state for support. You have three children, you live in section eight housing, but if you get a job or you get married, you lose your benefits. And so what happens is the people who, if you get a job that pays $12,000, you lose $14,000 in benefits. So the reason to have a UBI is to make it not contingent on not having a job and not getting married. Even if you get a job or get married, you still get it. The second reason that I'm in favor of UBI is that it would be portable. Right now, we have a bunch of people who are basically trapped in cities. And if they go somewhere else, they're going to lose their benefits. There's a lot of places where there are jobs. So if we had a federal, and notice that the, this argument has become more powerful recently, we're arguing about sending a check to every person in the U.S. for $3,600 per child. We're going to send out $1,200 or $1,400. So what we're doing, we're doing it in a haphazard way that people can't really predict. Now, the thing that I often get from people on the left and the right is they'll kind of say under their, under their voice, well, we can't give them the money. You know how they are. No, please tell me, how are they? Yeah. How is it that it's, it, the, the paternalism of the current system is remarkable? I admit oh. some people are yeah. going to fail. Some people are going to crash. But, that's but that's, that's going to happen choice. anyway. You know, it's happening now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I, I agree with you. And, um, you know, what you didn't say, though, is that the reason we have the programs the way we have them now is because with all that bureaucracy in the middle and all those iron triangles, you've got all this opportunity for corruption. <laughs> and, and who wants to miss all that corruption? But the, the people that the, benefit the, from every, it. Everything that you and I think is a cost, the state thinks of as a benefit. Right. Those are yeah. a bunch of employed people who are going to vote Democrat. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah, it's crazy. And, and I, you know, I would rather give the money to the poor people. If you care about poor people, let's make them not poor. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, there's an, another interesting thought about UBI. And I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised at myself that I'm coming around to this, too. I just think it's, you know, we got to have what we have and understand where we are. Right. You know, we're, we're not going to have this idyllic, free market, get rid of the state. It's just not going to happen. Okay. So let's be realistic, right? The other thing about UBI is it, it would encourage, potentially encourage more entrepreneurship and more risk taking. You know, if you knew you had the basics covered, right, then you're, you're willing to go out and maybe invent something great. And like, you know, gamble, at least you're not gambling your life, right? You're, you're just gambling your upside potential, but not your downside potential. And now you're not going to lose your house. You're not going to lose your apartment. You can continue to live. Yeah. Yeah. So in today's era, I mean, this will vary by inflation and so forth, but you know, what would be the ideal amount of UBI now? And would it be the same for everybody? And, you know, just give us some details. Those are really hard questions. So I would say, let's start at $1,000 a month per person, and we'll just put it on the 1040 form. Right now, I think it's 7,000. So we'll make it 19,000, and it'll be a credit if you don't have a job. So it's pretty easy to implement. Well, what do you have, 19,000, 1,000, 7,000? What even, what, I don't get it. Sure, forgive me. The standard deduction on your tax form is $7,000 per person. Okay. And so it'll be $1,000 a month, that's 12. So $12,000 plus seven would be 19,000. So the, the, we would change the standard deduction from 7000 to 19000 and then make it a credit so that if you don't have a job, you actually get a refund for that amount, except you only get the $1,000 once a month. I don't know if $1,000 is the right number, but it's less than we're actually talking about paying out now, and we're making it predictable. You just made the argument for why making it predictable is useful. Mm-hmm. So I think that the difficulty is 
we're going to do something much worse. Politically, the pressures are to do something much worse pretty quickly. And I think there's going to be a set of regulations that are likely to inhibit entrepreneurship. Whereas if we can get a UBI, and that's Andrew Yang's argument also. I've actually worked with him a little bit on this. The, it, it is interesting that some people on the left who are relatively pro-market think that this would open up uh, some chances for people. Mm -hmm. So you alluded earlier about uh, technology and prices declining because of technology. You know, I, I just bought a new car. It's sitting in my garage. Sometimes I don't even use my car for four or five days at a time. This is absolutely ridiculous. And before that, it, when life was normal, everybody's car was used about 4% of the time on average. So 96% of the time that expensive asset is unused. So the sharing economy makes a lot of sense to me. And you're saying the the sharing economy is deflationary, right? Yeah. You're paying to rent and share instead of own. So not only are you not paying for the car, you're not paying for a garage. Right. You're only paying for what you need. Yeah. Right. And and so that's good. That's efficient. That's logical. But, you know, there's always been, as I've explained it, Mike, there's always been this war. And the war is between these two opposing forces. On one side of the ring, you have technology and technology is deflationary. On the other side of the ring, you have bad monetary and fiscal policy, and that's very inflationary. Who's going to win? I have been predicting outrageous inflation now since about 2010 and it hasn't happened so the the government has completely lost control of the money supply and for reasons that are complicated we haven't seen substantial inflation in commodities now there probably are some things like assets the stock market housing prices so I, it, it, it's not that i think it, it's not a problem I think in real terms, people are going to become wealthier regardless of what the inflation rate is. So it's not just that it's deflationary, it's that actual costs are going to fall. People are going to become wealthier because it'll be so much, I'll have so much access to so much stuff. And that actually, I think, is the story of the 20th century, is the great enrichment, the decline in poverty in India, in China, in the United States. You're much better off being a poor person now in the United States than being wealthy in 1890. So the stuff that we have, uh, almost for free, is uh, the big benefit of capitalism. I think that's going to continue. So the yes, sure, the, the there is always this contest for for prices, but I think overall the effect, if you look at wages and prices, the the effect for most people is going to be an increase in wealth. However. We're going to get some people that don't have jobs, have no hope of jobs, and have no health care. And if that drives politics, then we're going to be in trouble. Okay, so we've had the sharing economy with us for, give or take, 12, 13 years now. Do you think we would have had much higher inflation, given all the money creation we've had, if we didn't have the sharing economy? Is that what's tamped it down? Nope, I'm confident that I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I, I, I do not understand why the monetary policy, we've, in, we've increased it in some cases 10% per month with no yeah. inflation. Right. Well, you can't say no inflation. We've definitely had some inflation, but it's not the hyperinflation some have predicted. Yeah. You know, so Peter Schiff's been very wrong, for example. But, you know, you look at asset prices yeah. and asset prices cause wealth inequality. Uh -huh. They cause a concentration. They cause a Cantillion effect. The Richard Cantillion, the economist you know about. And so the rich do get a lot richer and asset prices are going through the roof. Debt is so cheap. It's like free to buy assets now. So that causes a concentration of wealth because the people at the lower end of the spectrum can't take advantage of all that stuff like the people at the higher end can. But, you know, even the measure of inflation, is it is it even right the way we nope. measure it? Nope. But remember I said we're in a fog. We don't know what value is. We don't know what inflation is. We're not even really sure what employment is because I think we're going to start moving away from the 40-hour-a-week job towards gigs. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So we've been in the gig economy for a while too, though, don't you think? Absolutely. And there's some yeah. industries that have been dominated by what in effect is the gig economy, people that are self-employed. And so you see Assembly Bill 5 in California, the history of AB5 was yeah. the disaster. The, the, yeah. Well, the legislature says we're, we're going to make these people employees and not contractors. Right. And a whole bunch of writers and contractors said, are you kidding? That's a catastrophe. Yeah. And so eventually they pulled it back. But I, I really think those legislators thought that was the right response. They're mistaken. We're living in a fog. The regulatory authorities have no idea what to do.
Yeah, they're operating on an old model. They don't know how the economy needs to work with, you know, all this new stuff. Um, It isn't just the economy. It's also antitrust. So we, we should break up these companies. And so one other aspect of this that's interesting is how should we think of these enormous companies that dominate data and the ability to put information out into the world? So the usual sort of libertarian, I being a libertarian, usually I think, well, as long as the state doesn't control things, it'll turn out pretty well. Yeah, but these companies are so big, they're a proxy for the state. You can say that. My first job was at the U.S. Federal Trade Commission in the first Reagan administration. Oh, you know all about it then, yeah. (laughs) I I worked in antitrust policy, and antitrust has to do with raising prices and limiting innovation. Now, does Facebook do that? They're not raising prices. What they're doing is something else. It's just the, the bigness that comes from power. And so this is actually a criticism of the left that I think many people are sort of coming around to. Maybe bigness itself is enough of an offense that we should worry about it. Do these private companies, have they become large enough that they can actually control our access to information in ways that should, cons- I don't know if you want to call it censorship, mm-hmm. but they're, they're, they're the, because the New York Times did that, the Washington Post did that, but there were other newspapers. There's not a competition for Facebook. There's not a competition for right. Google. And there's it's hard to find another network to watch videos on that's not YouTube. Yeah, I know. I know. It's a, these companies, I've been saying this for 12 years, that these companies need to either be busted up under antitrust laws, and that's your expertise. You, you and Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I like a few things about Elizabeth Warren, for sure. But not just that. There's there's three things I talk about. Or they need to be regulated under common carrier laws. You know, for example, if the phone company, if we're talking on the phone and the phone company doesn't like what we're talking about, say we thought, you know, Trump won the election. Oh, God, I can't even say that because the video will be deleted from YouTube. So, you know, if the phone company doesn't like what we're talking about, they don't get to cancel our phone service as long as we pay for it. OK, and with Facebook and YouTube and, and, you know, Google and all these others and Twitter, we are paying for it. We're just paying with our data, not our money. And that's what makes it so difficult, I think, for regulators to get their head around. So bust up under antitrust, regulate under common carrier or have their algorithms exposed in public so everybody can know what they're doing and there's no secrets. So we can know why we see certain things in our newsfeed and why we don't see others, why certain emails get filtered, why others don't. You know, nobody knows why all this stuff is happening. It's it's just a big secret in a star chamber. It's ridiculous. Well, I, I, I do worry that things may not be so bad that involvement by the state can't still make them worse. So the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, I, I, I remember when we were worried about Microsoft, and it yep. sort of seems silly now that there was a big fuffle about Microsoft having a web browser. Yep. So the, the idea that competition over a web browser was the, the key to this seems sort of silly. So I wonder if in a couple of years this, there will be something else that we'll now be worried about. And I also think that the arguments about Section 230, there's two ways we could do this badly. One is to say the, the companies can do whatever they want. The other is to have the state compel speech and say, you must provide a platform for these people. And that that would be the common carrier approach. That was true under the Bell telephone monopoly. It it isn't really true now under cell phones because no cell phone company would do that because it's competitive. I don't think there can be a competition in these big network economies like Facebook or YouTube because having one that we can all go to is a benefit. I also think that breaking it up or having the state compel certain actions may have consequences that are hard to predict. So I'm no help. I'm conflicted about those things. I admit there's a problem and we need a new way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, we sure do. We sure do. Well, what else do you want to share, particularly about your book, Is Capitalism Sustainable? You know, that whole concept. What what do you mean by that? Are you talking about the environment or what? I mean, sustainable is such a buzzword about the environment. No, I mean capitalism. Will it survive in its own terms? And so the usual story that we tell about capitalism, and in fact, what I, as an economist, when I teach about markets, I say the advantage is that markets have people who are acting in their own self-interest, and yet the benefit is to the entire society. Somebody invests in a new product, and we all benefit from it. Well, the problem is that capitalism can, can, can turn into cronyism. 
which means that at some point it becomes more profitable for large companies to invest in lobbyists and lawyers than new engineers and salespeople. Well, once you do that, then the story about capitalism doesn't really work anymore. The story you tell, the story I tell about markets is we have competition, the result is lower prices, better quality. But if I can get subsidies from the government, basically I'm selling my product to the Congress. And then money is being taken at gunpoint from taxpayers and giving to corporate CEOs and stockholders. Well, that's actually not capitalism. So I've, I have friends who are lefties, and I'll say, you know, socialism doesn't work. Look at Venezuela. And they'll say, well, but that's not socialism. Well, I'm doing the same thing. So uh, I'll see Solyndra or I'll see one of these companies that's accepting subsidies, the bailouts to Wall Street. And I'll say, oh, that's not capitalism. That's cronyism. It struck me that capitalism is becoming cronyism in the United States. And if, if capitalism becomes cronyism, if these large companies depend on subsidies from the government, then the story that I tell about capitalism is not really right. And my defense of capitalism is assuming something that's not true. And so I think those of us who are defenders of markets need to recognize that some of the criticisms on the left uh, that are inherent about capitalism, capitalism seeking out benefits from the state because you can increase your profits, there's something to it. And so that means that, and this sort of, this goes back to your your point about uh, the large companies in speech. It may be that some of the solutions about bigness make more sense than I would have liked to admit 10 years ago. Yeah, no question. I mean, cronyism is not capitalism. <laughs> we don't have capitalism. Is there, show me capitalism. Where does yeah. it exist? Yeah, no, it's 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 not here. <laughs> it's, de- it's definitely not here. What else do you want to share? I mean, you've got such a great body of work, your career in politics and so forth, uh-huh. a short career as it is, yeah. as it were. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just tell us anything you want to share. Well, the my next book is about the platform economy, and I'm interested in platforms because platforms are things that solve the problem of triangulation. We find each other. Transfer, we can deliver the, the service or good, and we can collect the money. And trust, we can rely on each other. And so apps and uh, access to the internet have made platforms possible. I think that platforms are going to be awfully disruptive, but they're also going to allow new forms of cooperation. So Wikipedia, for example, is a platform. And so a lot of us look at Wikipedia. What's the value of Wikipedia? It doesn't appear on GDP. Now, you can say it's not a great source of information, but pretty often, if I want to start learning about something, I'll go look it up on Wikipedia. It's not a bad place to start. You shouldn't end there, but it's not a bad place to start. So we have a bunch of people that are finding new ways to cooperate that don't really involve markets and prices. So my book about platforms is... I think that the next step in the evolution of voluntary private cooperation, because this is not the state. This is more like Alexis de Tocqueville. This is groups, associations finding ways to cooperate with each other. We need to unfetter the creative abilities of individuals to work together in cooperation. And I think things like platforms are going to have a big... So the, one of the reasons I'm optimistic is these, these large companies that are network-driven, yes, they're a problem. But we're going to have a bunch of new platforms that are going to enable us to create communities of meaning around other dimensions. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. As long as we can overcome the censorship problems and the bigness problem and the cronyism problem, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, it, but there's there's always two things. There's always yeah. thesis and and an alternative. So right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Fair enough. Definitely. Definitely. Mike, give out your website. Well, it's michaelmunger.com, and the next book, uh, which is uh, platforms the perils and promise will be out in may excellent well we're looking forward to that and michael munger thank you so much for joining us it was a pleasure